And there is a lot of people who believe that SEO started around, I don't know what, 2010, 2007 mm, yeah, or so yeah. after the recession. And they don't realize that there was all these people that were trying, they were doing so much back in the day, trying to bring yeah. search into the mainstream. You knew you were part of something big. You didn't know what it was. And you were grateful to be there for every moment because every moment felt exciting. Every moment felt cool. And everyone you were talking to was so fucking brilliant in their own way. Especially back when nobody really understood what we were doing, mm -hmm. we were guaranteed that we could fly to a conference, be around our people, and everyone got it. And not only did they get it, but they were excited to learn what you knew. For us old-timer geeks, it's fun <laughs> to watch the videos and be like, oh yeah, so you're telling that part of the story, but we all know <laughs> what really happened then. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of SEO Pioneers. Today I'm talking to Heather Lloyd Martin and Heather has been described by Forbes magazine as a pioneer of SEO copywriting. So I'm sure that Heather has got lots of interesting stories to tell us and I'm very looking forward to speaking to her about them. I'm going to jump straight in today and ask Heather, um, Heather, what's your background and would you label yourself, describe yourself as an SEO first, first or a writer first? Oh, that is a wonderful question. I love that. Um, so my background is as a writer. So prior to getting into the wild world of SEO, I started as a copywriter as, and as primarily as B2B. So I would write marketing copy about like plate freezers for fishing boats because that's a thing. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? That's a wonderful <laughs> thing about being a writer or an SEO. You find out all these industries oh, yeah. you had no idea about. <laughs> and then as I was working that gig, and it was an in-house job, hated it, like all, all the reasons to hate it, my boss at that time was dealing, getting on the internet. So this was like modem internet, super slow, like 2400 baud modem. It made all the noises. And then I realized, okay, if I'm writing for these guys and they're paying me peanuts and I hate the gig and it's really weird, what would happen if I translated all of this to what's happening online, having no idea what kind of opportunity there would be? So in that way, I got into the world of SEO as a writer, because as I started learning about SEO, then I thought, well, wait, you're writing this for people. People are going to be reading the content and you want them to do something. So that's when I started building all these bridges between what I knew as a direct response copywriter for writing for like print and magazine and all of that to what I see working online and squishing all of that together. So early days, it was fun. I mean, it's still fun, right? But early, early days, it was fun because it was like doing stuff that felt similar but different than what had been done before. And so I could really get into seeing how everything came together at the same time that all of us were seeing how everything came together because this was new for everyone back then. It's quite interesting actually you just said that you were um, writing for direct marketing. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, because I remember... Um, in the early days, I did quite a lot of reading about um, and going back to all the classic direct direct marketing uh, masters, Claude C. Hopkins. Um, oh, I've forgotten all their names now. But I, I went through quite a period of um, I read, and I think it really helps to inform. Uh, I think yes. it actually gives quite a, a basis to SEO today. Exactly, because back in the day, at the very beginning, and and it's. SEO has shifted so much because back in the day, it was so very technical oriented and nobody wanted to talk about the marketing or the writing or anything else because that then it was just, here's what you do with the website. Here's how you code it. Here's all the things you do to get this ranking. And people weren't talking about the other part of it if you want these folks to convert. So it was taking all of these these old style direct response folks and then translating what they said into what worked today. So one of the folks that I would read who's still an active copywriter is Bob Bly. 
and he wrote yeah. the copywriter's handbook, right? Yeah. And yeah, blah, blah, we talk yeah. about yes. how to do this and how to set up the personas. And yeah. back when I was in my early 20s, like, oh, wow, okay, this makes sense. So entering that into search, it mm -hmm. made perfect sense because we wanted people to take that next step after they saw the website positioning top mm -hmm. 10 in, what was it back then, Alta Vista? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Google wasn't even a thought back then. Yeah, I, I find it really interesting. And I've always said that, you know, uh, SEO, it, it's still what underlies SEO is classic marketing. And if you've got those classic marketing skills, it informs you. And it, it you know, it took a while for it to catch on, but it's just all come full circle, hasn't it now? It's now it's all about, anyway, I digress, Heather, because um, obviously you're telling your story. So uh, we can geek of... out about all of this. <laughs> <laughs> what year were you? Um, what year were you first? When you were first getting online? What year was that? Would oh, geez. Say? First online was early days of when we had the Mac SE 30s and, and it was AOL. So we're talking maybe 96, 97. Um, and I was heavily into AOL back those in those days. And I had the, the handle of Heather L1, which if AOL was still around like that, you would never see. It was like this cool handle that was hard to give up. And um and so that's how I entered into it is like getting online, the discussion groups and, and all of that, and then realizing, oh, there's like the World Wide Web outside of this gated community. And through that, there was uh, getting to know people through discussion groups like iSearch was one of them, the big one back in the day that I'm sure a lot of people had mentioned. But then there was another one uh, that I was involved with that was called uh, WTB, which ended up to be Women Talk Business. So it was very early networking days prior to when we all do this on websites or Insta or Facebook or Slack, where people would post stuff and say, hey, I'm having a problem here or I need help here. And that's where we would have a curtain, a certain core group uh, of women in the early days helping each other out. That's where I believe I met Jill Whalen because she and I would have been part of that back in the late 90s, early 2000s, both figuring our way around what is this SEO, what is this internet new opportunity that we can start leveraging. Oh, that's interesting. It's quite nice to hear that even like in the mid 90s, there was a, a woman, a women in business. I mean, I know we have the uh, women in tech, um, which is a really uh, a big thing now, but um, that it even existed back in the 90s, um, the women in business program, uh, sorry, community. So uh, women talk business. Yes, it, it is cool. And it's and it's wonderful that even back then there was, you know, because there weren't that many women. in tech. Well, there weren't that many people in technology then. And with the AOL chat rooms, a lot of times you met the weird guys that were like, hey, baby, what you doing? If they figured out you're a woman. And so it was this really cool, safe space back in the day to where you could learn from other women and find out what was going on and help each other grow. And it's it's awesome how that has had morphed and changed and had different addition to different things throughout the years to where I still believe there's a pretty nice mentorship with a lot of women that will help uh, younger women in the industry figure out what's going on, get learn how to do speaking gigs, learn how to do writing, whatever they want to do for thought leadership. So I love to see how that's continued on because it's not that case in all industries and with SEO, there has been a lot of, I, I think, there's been a lot of mentorship with, with younger women coming up. Um, how did you find the group, by the way? Oh, geez. Uh, I surfed back then like I surf today. So probably it was one of those uh, AOL groups where I knew there was a discussion group somehow, and I got involved doing that. So, and, and probably there was a certain amount of networking too. I mean, I've always, one of the cool things about how I've, I've been wired throughout the years is I've always worked alone behind the laptop and use this kind of interaction as the way I meet people. Uh, so even back then, it was a cool way to be like, hey, I'm doing this new thing too. Let's trade ideas. And, and do you know of other groups or organizations or places that might need someone like me to help them out? How, how easy did you find it in the early days to actually start to branch out and find communities? 
probably there was probably a certain amount of word of mouth, but also a lot of searching or 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 are seeing things that other people had posted somewhere else and then realizing, oh, that's another place that I can look. So for the early people that wanted to get into it, it was going down almost like a hyperlink rabbit hole of finding one resource and then somebody mentions another and then you learn mm. about that. That's mm. how I learned about iSearch back in the day. Mm. Of It might have been through Jill or Jill might have learned through someone else or somehow, uh, but just finding, oh, there's other people that are talking about this geeky stuff. And here is this curated newsletter where you can see the best questions according to the moderator and the best answers from, from industry professionals. This is really cool. And you know, today we kind of take that for granted because we have so many ways to reach these people. Back then, to be able to know that Derek Wheeler had posted something and responded to me, or Marshall Simmons, or Detlef Johnson, that was like a big thing. Greg Bozer, another person I know that you you interviewed for this. Um, and so that was another way that it, we almost had were able to build celebrity back in the day because we saw who was posting, who wasn't posting, and got to know people's personalities and skill sets through that. So when you started um, working as a copywriter online, um, did you was it just a natural a natural progression of your existing skills, or did you find you had to evolve it or adapt it in any way for online? It was very natural, and it happened very quickly. So there was there was a time that um, that I was married uh, back back in the early days, and I was starting to grow the business, but I it wasn't a huge priority. I was start, kind of getting my feet wet, learning SEO, doing all the stuff, learning SEO writing, um, and then my husband died, and suddenly I was left with no income, and I had to build a business really fast. So fortunately, back then, either through hustle or good luck or timing or whatever, I was able to build a business really quickly and work for clients uh, in terms of like writing website copy. I wrote a lot of website copy for cosmetic dentistry. I can talk about cosmetic dentists to this day and talk about veneers versus this versus that. Um, but just to be able to build out all of this, this web copy. And back then, again, not too many people doing it. So you would tell people, well, I write website copy and they'd be like, whoa, what? I, I was just thinking about having a website and you can help me. So it was because it was also on, on people's minds of like, this is new. It might not be every business had a website back then, but businesses were starting to get the idea of like, this is important for us to do. And so I was already sort of pre-positioned to help these folks because I had been doing it for a long time relatively back then. <laughs> and they were looking, people were looking for someone like me. So it was, it happened quickly, but it it became very easy. And I learned how to like network with web designers and like Jill was how that worked out. She was doing the design and she needed someone to write the content. So those kinds of synergistic relationships happened pretty easily back in the day and probably still do. But back in the day when everything was new and exciting, it was cool to be like, oh, you have a complementary skill. Let's work together and see what kinds of things we could do. Did you, um, as you started to evolve your skills, what kind of changes we are making to introduce SEO I mean as because you came from traditional copywriting and you know nobody knew what SEO was so as it began to evolve what were you doing I mean can you think back to any specific things that you were introducing and learning that started to set you apart with the with the copywriting you were doing for websites um the the big thing that set me apart was that I was doing SEO writing and that was so new back in the day, nobody knew what it was. And I was actually profiled by Writer's Digest, late 90s, maybe early 2000, uh, as an SEO writer, as here is a new niche for writers that you might not have heard be about before. So in that way, the positioning was kind of happening for me in that here was this opportunity for freelancers who are always looking for an opportunity or writers to get involved in this new type of writing that they had not heard about before. So new techniques back then was just adding keywords to copy and that blew people away. And so 
there was a couple of well, there were a lot of objections that we were overcoming back in the day when it came to SEO writing. Uh, one is that people did not want to read copy. So people would want to have pretty websites with lots of graphics, and they didn't understand even back then you needed to have some content on the page to position. So we were overcoming the objection of people don't read, which we will have seen happen throughout the years of SEO. Um, there was also the objections that people had where they didn't want to have a website with a lot of information because if you had information on your website, no one would call them. This was a big thing in the B2B world. So often what I was doing in those early days is not just introducing, hey, you have to have keywords on the page and here's how to put them in in a way that doesn't start interfering with how the copy sounds, but yes, your readers do want to read. So back then, um, adding keywords to the content was totally different in that it was more, it was kind of more of a percentage deal. I mean, I don't want to say keyword density, but it was like, make sure you have your keyword on the page at least three times or more, and your copy is least, you know, X number of, of words. So there are a lot more guidelines that we talked about, uh, not necessarily because they were hard and fast even back then, uh, but also, but just to give people an idea of how to write for this new type of, of content. And it was, it was a, an early struggle as, as it can be, because of course people want to shove in every keyword they could. Mm -hmm. Um, so teaching them like, you don't need to do that. Um, there were the people who didn't want to, to research key phrases at all because it was such an early step, uh, or, or new step. And this is something that we still deal with today. If people don't want to do the key phrase research, but they still want the rankings on those particular keywords. So it was, it was like moving a ship slowly into a new direction and trying to show people, hey, if you've been a copywriter for years, this isn't a threat to what you already know. This builds on the skills of what you know, and you're able to reach your readers in a new way uh, with that implied threat of, but if you don't do it this way, what's going to happen is that your, your content isn't going to position the way you want it to, and that you're writing all this content for nothing. So that's when we saw in the early days of web writing, a lot of writers would specialize in either writing website copy or SEO copy. They often didn't do both. Uh, and there were companies that would say, I just want to have website copy, not realizing that that needed that extra step to have that optimized. Today, it's slightly, I would say it's different in that companies usually know that if they want to position in Google, their, their content needs to go through an extra step for that. Uh, and to, to have that, to have the SEO writing best practices folded into that strategy. Uh, but back then, there was still controversy of like, well, I have a website, isn't that good enough? Do I have to do this too to, to, in order to get it to position the engines? How are people even searching in the engines? So there was a lot of education back in those early days of, again, like here's the skill set you have. It's awesome. I'm not asking you to reinvent the wheel or write crappy content. I'm just saying, here's an opportunity where you can do something similar but different and reach people slightly differently. What, what was it that, made you recognize can you remember what it was that made you recognize <clears throat> to go down the SEO writing path rather than just being a web copywriter oh that's a good question probably because opportunity like I saw a web copywriter and, and that seemed fun and interesting and I liked all of that, but there was something about SEO and having that little bit of technical geeky stuff that intrigued me uh, because even though I've always been a writer and I've focused on those types of communication skills, there's a big part of me that's a geek. And I think that's what has helped me be successful throughout all of these years is that geeky part of me that can understand basically what's going on with a site, that can communicate with IT, that likes to learn all of these underneath the hood things that helps make a website go. So mm -hmm. 
yes, the content is fun and digging into conversion theory and how to write headlines and all of that, that has its own geeky joy for me. But shoring that up with the technical part of SEO, I think that's what's kept me in the game as long as it has. Because website copy, you know, give or take, you're, you're kind of writing the same type of thing. But I mean, look what's happened with ChatGPT over the past, what, three and a half months? Boom, everything changes. And that's the type of thing that I love of waking up in the morning and figuring things will probably be similar but different than how they were the day yeah. before. And that's okay. And I like to work on that that edge of uncertainty. How were you doing the keyword research in those early days? Because obviously that you know must have been a very new uh, thing and you can't have had the same tool. Obviously, you, know, you didn't have the same tools and access to data as we have now. Word tracker. Word tracker was around back in the early days, back early enough. So uh, Jill ended up finding them however long ago and uh, worked with Andy and Mike. And then th that's how the key phrases started flowing is, is through word tracker. Uh, and then us early geeky people were also pretty good even back then of like figuring out, all right, how are people searching? What what words do we want to start thinking about using? So we were already starting to do that manual key phrase research process in our heads prior to having the tools. The tools, of course, helped us as they do really narrow stuff down. But yeah, it was it was all early days. And so that's why when I teach about how to do this, a lot of times I'm teaching the manual of like, OK, You've got a tool that will tell you this, but let's go into Google search results page and really dig into what you see there. Because for me, that's the more natural way to do it than looking at a tool and it helps internalize the data a lot more. I can start realizing if the, the data I'm good at getting is good for me or not right for the moment. But yeah, it was all word tracker. And, and it's so funny to think of like how all the people, who else came up, um, Submit Wolf, uh, then we had the guys from, oh, geez, I'm trying to think like web position gold was back there, but I don't think they did key phrase research submit wolf. I don't think did key phrase research or maybe they did ranking reports or a lot of big ranking report companies back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we all kind of figured it out as we went along. And back then we never talked about search intent. It was, it was good enough to have like women's tennis shoes as a keyword because it wasn't competitive like it was to or like it is today so it was super rudimentary even in the early days but still a lot of fun because you have a persona like you would with any other creative document and so you know who you're writing to but then the key phrase research helps really dig into like, what do I want to say? How do I want to say it to these people? How do I want to work in these search terms that I know they need to see in order to, you know, have my page convert plus help the reader feel like that they're in the right place? How do I work this in in a way that builds and that shows information and builds empathy and everything that you want to do with that? So it's it's fun to see how the key phrase research can help almost set a, a like an outline of how you write what you write and gives you that even more insight of how people are thinking. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also the psychology. I mean, I, I do masses of uh, keyword research, but I just, I love the the psychology and also the fast, it's the fascination with, you know, the, the random insane searches that you find when you're, you know, you're digging into the <laughs> tools, like they're really obscure. Um, really obscure keywords i've seen some really hilarious things in my time but it, oh, it's yeah. the psychology of it is it's such an insight into it's a sociological insight into how people are thinking and how the masses and you know the way people search i just find that oh it's just addictive yeah. Oh, it's so cool. And and that is, even in the early days, that is how I would get folks that were resistant to, to key phrase research, SEO writing, to get into it. Because I would say, here's a way to dig into what your prospects, your readers are thinking, the questions that they have. And before, you know, back in the old days, we would have to like <laughs> talk to people and go to trade shows and run surveys and all of these things that 
we might still do today, but that we today we have so many other more seamless, easy ways to get that data. Where back then it was harder to get that data and mine it and use it the way that we needed to use it. So it's so fun to be able to have all of this at our fingertips and say, oh, people are interested in this incredibly obscure key phrase that might only pop up a few times, but if people click on it, then it's like $100,000 easy. Awesome, okay, I'll use that somehow. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so who else were you, you mentioned, um, Jill Whelan that you met through the, uh, so was it women talk business group? Yes. Yeah. Women talk business. Who else did you first start to connect with in the early days? Oh, geez. Uh, so that group, I'm not even sure how many people are around doing stuff anymore. I, I was trying to remember names last night, have zero names, but like early search days, um, sort of all of the old search OG folks all got to know each other and are still friends today. So we've got... Um, Sherry Thoreau, who is brilliant in in her with what she's done and everything that she's done for the industry, uh, Detlev Johnson, Greg Bozer, uh, Marshall Simmons, Derek Wheeler, Kat Seda. Uh, I don't believe Kat's in search anymore, but she's doing her own brilliant stuff. Barbara Call. Uh, so you've got there were very few people that were, and of course Danny, <laughs> Danny back then before he was a Googler and was like us, you know, just figuring this out as we went along, um, Chris Sherman. So we were this core group of people back in the day that because there were only a few of us that knew how to talk about this, we would go from conference to conference. And at first it was domestic and then it became international and we'd be flying to Search Engine Strategies London or Search Engine Strategies Sydney and talking about it there and seeing how different countries are might be like a little ahead or a little behind and learning from other people of what they were doing back in the day. So it's it's funny how like if I think back and I can think of like 20 people that I was interacting with, I'm, I'm sure there were more. And now when I think of search and everybody that encompasses, I mean, there are like hundreds of people that I could probably name off the top of my head or folks that are really good at what they do and super well branded and have contributed a lot over the years. Um, but back then, not not a lot of us, but we all became like each other's brother and sister because we were learning as we went along and, you know, figuring out how to work with clients and hearing about, oh, well, I, I, this client came to me and I don't really want them. Could you use them? And then helping people, helping people build their businesses that way. We would talk about things like that too. And so that was a really fun experience uh, that I've never had since. I'm not sure if I ever will have again of a group, a core group of people building this industry, mm -hmm. figuring things out, and then being, for the most part, you know, completely cool with, do you need business? I need business. Let's help each other through this because we're all trying to do this and figuring it out together. And for, and I've talked to other people that have been in early days of search that might've been a branded speaker or worked on the sidelines. And they say the same thing of like, back then you knew you were part of something big you didn't know what it was and you were grateful to be there for every moment because every moment felt exciting. Every moment felt cool. And everyone you were talking to was so fucking brilliant in their own way. And we respected the hell out of each other. And we still do. Yeah, this this industry, it's full of some incredibly smart, in super smart, amazing people. Um, I, I feel really privileged to know some incredibly intelligent people who are friends uh, through this industry yeah yes um how um as you started to connect like with the technical seos how how did you how were they perceiving what were you doing what kind of reactions were you getting from them were they happy to embrace you embrace the kind of work you were doing and work with you or did you get any resistance <laughs> that is an excellent question because Traditionally, the marketing person does not, you hear that you don't get a lot of respect from technical because you're talking different languages. And, and I get that. Um, 
it's odd that that never happened to me the the because back then i was like one of very few people that came from the marketing background there were probably others i'm i can't remember who but i was one that was focusing primarily on the writing i talked about the tech but i was mostly the writer so even i expected at conferences you know coming in as you know, the token woman creative writer working with all these geeky guys, they'd be looking at me like, eh, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> and I don't know why that happened, either because we were all in it together, uh, because I respected them and I learned how to talk as much tech as I could, you know, and even to this day, I can do it and I will preface everything with, I can take this to a certain, to a certain point in the conversation, I know what I know, and then I'm going to back off and defer to you, but we, I want to still have those high-level discussions. And every technical person that I've ever come across, whether in the industry, early days, or even now working with like in-house clients that might have the technical person who doesn't quite know search, but they know programming and websites really well, I still have those kind of very respectful relationships where they know I don't know what they know, I know they don't know what I know, but together we can create a really kick-ass campaign for the client or whoever that we're working with. And so that has always been really cool. Um, like the the most of the guys in, in search at that point, early days were technical geeks. And I still consider them like my big brothers from the industry. And I'm very, I feel so fortunate that I had those kind of interactions because I know people that have come from a marketing background and they didn't quite feel as respected or they felt like they weren't listened to quite as much. And for me, it was always, it was always easy. So however that worked out, whether that was time, place, personality, however, I feel very grateful that I've always had a really wonderful relationship with anything, everyone from the technical side, and they've been able to respect my knowledge and vice versa. So back in early days, when did you, do you remember first encountering Google? Oh, uh, let's see. Well, we heard about the Google stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that we were talking about AltaVista and all of that, and then Google came in. And I remember the first you'd asked about the Google dances, like when Google mm. came in and they started making a big, a, they started wanting to take over the world. It was obvious that that's where they were going, um, that going to the Google dances and have, seeing the Google representatives at every uh, every conference, that was that helped everybody get used to what Google, who Google was at that time, what they were doing. So when I was running uh, programming conferences for the Direct Marketing Association, um, Google back in the day was always really good about having a representative come and talk to people. And maybe it was uh, about how Google search worked, how people could position. And that was always an interesting thing for marketers because they were able to connect directly with who they thought was controlling their search rankings. You know, today in, in our world, you know, we're used to having that kind of access. Back then it was a big deal. Um, so we started, you know, other search engines, like we didn't start thinking about AltaVista for a while. You know, Yahoo started to drop away and they had their paid inclusion. That was a big thing. Um, but then suddenly Google just st stayed more and more popular and that suddenly the conversation started shifting from, well, when you're you're optimizing websites for Bing or, well, back then it wasn't Bing, was it? Um, but uh, for Microsoft or for Yahoo, whatever, then it started looking at like, who is getting the most market share? And that market share was slowly and surely started to be Google, Google, Google. And so that's when a lot of what we talked about became very Google centric. And Google, that to their credit at that time, they were trying to like, hey, we've got this dance, visit us at the campus, we'll bust all of you in, we'll feed you full of booze and food, and then we'll <laughs> say, let's see how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where a lot of the shit happened back in the day. I mean, granted, we had the the, the events and, and, and people would speak, but like it is in a lot of other places, 
the networking, the real, here's how things work. Uh, let's get to know how this works for that. That happened at the networking parties. It happened in the bar. <clears throat> I mean, you probably heard at, uh, during these things over and over how much stuff happened in the bars after the sessions. And that's just because that, how we all got together, talked about what was going on. Same thing happened. We were at Google. We all got together, talked about what's going on, had a good time when we were doing it. Have you got any interesting stories about what was happening at Google Dance behind the scenes? <laughs> I have to ask. <laughs> oh, there were things like there. I will tell that there. I can't narc on the people who did certain stuff. I mean, there were there were things I think stolen off the campus that somebody <laughs> might have gotten. Uh, my thing is, I always wanted to get into one of the Google buildings. That was it for me because they had security posted, so you weren't able to get in. So I know people did, um, but supposedly you weren't able to get in. But my thing is like, I want to get in just so I say that I could. So I would like go to security security guard security guard. I have to use. Bathroom. I have to use bathroom. Will you let me in? And I would. And that was like my thing. <laughs> but back then it was, you know, that was another thing about search is that we were really good at what we did and really smart, but we were all in, what was it like our late twenties, early thirties to a certain extent. And so we would party really hard and maybe people aren't talking about the, on these, these interviews, but I will. We partied really hard and had a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and the Google Dances was one of those places where we would make that happen. And thank goodness back then, I mean, this is when cell phones weren't a normal yeah. thing even. Yeah. So there weren't <clears throat> people snapping pictures everywhere. We could be safe doing what we did because we had that code of silence of what you do, you're not going to talk about because you've been watching me do the same thing. So together, we will get up the next morning and pretend like none of this ever happened and do our thing. <laughs> what happens in Google Dance stays at Google Dance. Exactly. You know, and if you talk about any of the webmaster radio parties with Darren, Darren and, and Brandy, Darren Bevan, same type of thing. Great parties, super fantastic networking, but same kind of code of silence, you know, but they were also a way for us to get to know each other, network, trade information. So although there was that like fun party aspect for the way that we worked as search marketers, it was how a lot of stuff got done. So when I used to do stuff for the Direct Marketing Association, they'd say, we want to have a breakfast meeting at 630 in the morning with all the search marketing colleagues. I would say, no <laughs> one's going to show up. I'm not going to show up and I chair this. So <laughs> that's not how we're wired, you know. <laughs> when when you were at the excuse me, when we were at the Google Dances, um, were Larry and Sergey active at those? Were they in a part of it? They were the first one. I've actually got a picture somewhere um, where it was Della Johnson introducing me in to Sergey and Larry. And they knew us back then. And I say new in air quotes. There's probably some folks that they knew more of. I would imagine Greg Bozer would be one of those just because Greg has always been so brilliant with how he does stuff and loves to <laughs> push that all low. Um, but still small group, you know, small community. So we all were able to like say that we knew Sergey and Larry and we'd have the photos of us being taken with them so we could show our clients like, it's not just us saying that, look. So it's funny that you look back in these now and I look at the photos and I'm like, oh, I was blonde back then and nobody had gray hair. You know, everyone looked so young because oh, we were yeah. so young. Yeah. <laughs> and they would come in and do their thing. I mean, now I think it was maybe two Google dances that were, they were kind of more visible. There might've been more, other people might remember that, but I just remember the one of like, oh my God, look who's there. We know them. This is so cool. And, you know, and now they are, they are, and we're kind of used to that. <laughs> so they weren't, so they weren't in there partying hard amongst everybody. They, they I don't the remember that. I do remember one person who was, um, that, that uh, was part of Google back in the day that has since moved on, but that, a lot changed when Google went public too. So before it was a little bit more free for all. And then as soon as Google started going public, then people started checking that behavior. I remember when uh, the Google dance where Google was just about ready to go public or just right after. And it was different because suddenly those people that 
you know, we parted with and are just like, hey, you're a brilliant dude. Um, that brilliant dude was like the number three hire at Google and suddenly worth a gazillion dollars. And that was like the beginning of all of that happening for some of us of seeing people we know go from just normal person to suddenly you know that they're a lot they're worth a lot of money because Google just did their thing. Um so you were quite active in the conference circuit as well. What was the can you remember the very first conference you went to? Search engine strategies Boston. Yes, search engine strategies Boston. And it was writing for search engines it was the topic. And it wasn't really a conference where you would have a speaker. I mean, there probably were that, but where I was is there were a bunch of like a big ballroom and there were tables, little round tables, like where people would eat, um, scattered throughout the ballroom. And they'd have like little tent cards of like, if you want to know about this, come to this table. And so Jill and I were on the writing for search engines table and I was petrified because it was like, ah, uh, but it was fun. So we did that. Uh, we did that there. Before that, Jill and I had done a conference in uh, Amsterdam at the car a and um danny sullivan wasn't able to make it because his wife was going to go in labor then so he needed someone to talk about search so that was like the first official conference that that i did back and they even had like a gong i don't know jill talked about this but if you went over time on your speaking gig that they had a big gong in the background <laughs> and the moderator would be like boom and that was the way that they got you off the fuck page so i did not want to be gone <laughs> so going to round tables easy and then after that it was like let's have heather come in to talk about search and strategies dallas and then it was san francisco was another one san francisco was awesome back then it was at the fairmont um and it was just talking about writing for search engines. But back then, after that first panel or, or roundtable discussion, then we got into more like Jill would talk a little bit and then I would talk a little bit on an actual stage. So we moved up from the table to the stage. And then, just, <laughs> and then it became like a normal part of how the conferences ran is there would be a writing for search engines track or session somewhere in, in the programming. Is there any of those earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, any of those earlier conferences that stands out to you as one of your favorite events? Search Engine Strategy Chicago. Um, that was probably mid 2000s, prior to the recession. And uh, they had somebody, it was Jim Staub from Position Tech, um somebody else i can't remember who they rented out the buddy guy nightclub and they were able to get buddy guy come in and play a couple songs and that was an incredible experience one because in chicago and we're at buddy guy's night uh, cl nightclub and we're all partying and having fun and dancing and and enjoying each other's company but just because it was just such a a fun time to to remember of something that we never would have had any other exposure to, to any other time. And like, how often do you get to have Buddy Guy come in to do this private thing for you for, for a couple songs? And plus we were doing our thing. We were still sharing information with people and, and feeling really good about how we were helping. That It's one of the really awesome things back in the day it wasn't it wasn't just the people or or the parties or the fact that we were all in this fast moving industry and all of that but for me at least it was knowing that what i was talking about what my friends were talking about what we were doing was having such an impact on people's lives we were hearing about how people were able to build businesses because of what they learned from us or get out of bad jobs and start something new because of what they learned. Or companies that today are huge, but back then were really small and growing. And we saw how they were able to grow because of that. So that that part was exciting. So the, the parties were awesome. The conferences were fun. Uh, Search Engine Strategies, Chicago, or, um, San Francisco, the early one, that was awesome. Um, any of the San Jose ones, because we were right, sort of right there in the middle of it, 
But the things I remember are sort of the highlights of there was a party here, the speaking gig there, um, getting on a plane and seeing my friends in Sweden and being able to speak to a Swedish audience that next morning uh, and feeling like I had come home because that's where my family was from. Those are the things that that when I think back, make up sort of the quilt, patchwork quilt of what I remember about the SEO industry. All of these awesome experiences with awesome people in awesome places doing awesome things. And I just stuffed this interview for the word awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hyperlink that to go to another landing page. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> sorry, you really threw me off. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you think um how do you think online copy uh seo copywriting has changed over the years do you think it's evolved it's evolved there was a time that it was really shitty real shitty back when keyword stuffing worked thin content was in prior to panda um there was a push to like we can kind of see now with chat gpt of like content is easy to push out let's just push it out we don't care what it sounds like. We just want to have pages with keywords that people can land on. Uh, and although that's never been what I talked about or stressed, of course, people would do that because it was working. And so, yeah. Uh, but and then we saw from like I mentioned at the beginning, people didn't want, thought, oh, well, no one wants to read. We don't want words on the website. Uh, and then it went to, well, people don't want to read that much. And then suddenly it evolved into people want to read 4,500 words on a recipe <laughs> or on a, <laughs> on a, some sort of white paper. So we want to give them all the words. Um, and I feel like finally we're starting to realize that copywriting and even SEO copywriting, we might have loose best practices or rules, but it's all down to what is good for the reader? What do they need to see? What answers their question better than anyone else? And that might be that you write something longer because that's what fits the query and that's what people need to see. Or in many cases, it's not like that. So it's, it's seeing how people have evolved from wanting to have hard and fast rules to, know, to knowing that it can be really squishy. And that we're making a lot of educated guesses along the way through tools and what we can see on Google and what we know our readers want. Um, I've also seen throughout the years, there has been a uptick on people wanting to learn how to write better. And this I find really satisfying. It's not just, I want to learn how to put words on a page because anyone can do that. It's, I want to learn how to use sales writing formulas in a way to help structure my content slightly differently and resonate with the reader faster. I want to be able to dig into a reader persona and come up with the right voice for the client, not just one that's easy for me to kick out because I've written a bunch of content that day. Uh, so that emphasis on good writing and in, in, in looking at how to evolve your craft looking at say chat gpt and not looking at it as a enemy but as like a writing assistant things like that uh, have been exciting to watch because i remember that when i used to talk about conversion and ask telling people you need to write to have a goal in mind and people would look at me funny like well no we're just writing for rankings and today there's a whole different conversation about what we write and how we write and how we even repurpose what we write so we're not on this constant hamster wheel of con content creation and i find that again that's exciting that we're having different conversations so as seo has evolved as the tools have evolved as our knowledge has evolved as the technology has evolved then the writing has also evolved and we've we've learned that people will read uh, if we're giving them the right words to read, uh, that people do want to have useful information on a website if it's presented in a way that resonates with them and that we have to get out of thinking it's all about writing it for Google. We now are much better at writing things for the reader first 
knowing that the secondary goal of, of course, having that position in Google to where we can have maximum findability going on. So there has definitely been an evolution for the better. Now, will ChatGPT change that a little bit? Of course. Um, and I think that there will be kind of a push for some people, not the folks that are in this every day, but for some businesses that look, will look at this like, this is the holy grail. We can kick out all the content we want to for $20 a month or for free. Uh, so there might be that little bit of like flooding the index with crappy content, like we saw back in the day pre-panda when we were all spinning content, not me, others, uh, when people would spin content. Uh, and I think that once folks realize that that's not going to work, then they'll back off from that and start looking at what does. Saw that happening with, with Panda. Uh, I'll probably see that happening again. I do know that anecdotally from what I see and the people contacting me, that more companies are interested in not just how to rep through Google, but how to connect with their readers, how to write in a voice that their readers will love and feel like, oh, this company, this person, whatever is the resource that I need. And that's so gratifying to see how that, again, how that conversation has shifted throughout the years. Do you think with chat GPT, do you think that um, people, again, they're going to, as you just said, they, they're going to use the tool, uh, think that it's going to take over and do their job for them, but then realize that actually it's just a tool and the tool is only as good as the person operating it. So you need yes. to have somebody who knows what they're doing, right? I, I'm telling my writers now, my certification group, it's like you you may cl lose clients depending on the type of clients that you work with. Because if you have a business who is where they're worried about money, they they read the news, they think, oh, any second now something bad is going to happen. It would make sense if they went towards a less expensive option, if they thought that that could help them. But to your point that they're going to realize that okay, it's a tool, but you're still going to need a, a writer to help with that, to smooth stuff out. And it's just going to take one crappy article, one big mistake, one something, or none of their, their content positioning. So there's always going to be that education as the technology changes. There's the, the education of how does that technology work with what we know about human psychology, how with what we know about how people use websites. And what we know now is like that kind of content, the way ChatGPT is, is now, it's probably not going to position in Google without a human going in and touching it and updating it and doing all the things. So we know that because we're in it. We see the capabilities and the limitations. There's going to be companies that don't yet, but they will see later about how it is a tool, but they're always going to need that person to help them figure out how to best present their brand online. Yeah, I mean, we've already seen examples, haven't we, of um, <clears throat> tools that are uplifting misinformation. That That's going to be the big thing. You know, you can't just have um, a tool kick out an article on uh, some random topic without actually knowing the topic in depth yourself to know whether it's full of mistakes or not. Exactly, um, exactly. I think Jeff GPT, I did ask it to, to write something about me and it was wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't remember what uh, that it worked. I had worked for an agency or started with an agency, you know, and it wasn't a huge, I mean, it was a mistake, but for someone who wouldn't have known, it would be like, oh, that makes sense. Heather started mm -hmm. with an agency yeah. back in the day, but yeah. it was still wrong. I think it's going to be really interesting. I think there's going to be some uh, fantastic applications of how it can be used in some interesting ways, like, you know, creating, um, small uh your own sort of small ai database on a su subject that you can train it yourself um but yeah i'm gonna be really fascinated to watch what happens but I, i'm still uh ultimately not concerned that for high value writers that it will replace i think the low end of the market is going to get washed away for sure easily I think, yes and, yeah anybody who has value um you know who approaches writing in the same way as yourself does I don't think there's going to be any concern there. In fact, I think there'll probably be even more, even more demand for that. Exactly, because those <clears> subject <throat> matter experts, the people that can create high conversion copy, they're going to be safe no matter what happens. And that's another thing that I recommend to writers or people that are established or coming up in the world is 
your work doesn't speak for itself unless you can show, hey, I was able to drive this kind of income for a client or do this, uh, reach this kind of goal. And you can't get that kind of result with ChatGPT. But when you're going in and selling services, if you're able to say, this is what we've done for other folks, then it makes you more valuable. It helps you get paid more. And that, to your point, you don't worry about the technology aspect because you know what you bring to the table is so much better and different than anything that could ever be produced out of ChatGPT. Just circling right back to the beginning, what do you, what skills do you think that you learned in the uh, 90s uh, have remained and still apply today? Oh, that's a good question. Um, back in the 90s, even back then, it was what does the customer, what does the reader, what does the person, the website want to see? What do they need to see to be able to stay on the website as long as possible? And where where I had come from back then was writing, say, catalog copy, right? And so one of the things about catalogs is that you have a catalog and you are flipping through a catalog. And there is no other competition for that catalog unless you're a hoarder and you have a thousand other catalogs in your house. <laughs> but online, it's so much different and that you're competing with all of these other sites that are just a back button away. Today, that is like, duh, of course we know that. Back then, that was revolutionary of what do we do now to get people's attention and help them realize that they are in the right place and start building. It was like early community building, even if all we were doing was writing website copy. And so one of the things that I take to everything that I'm doing today is, is that thought of like, what can I do to help people feel seen, to help people feel like they're going to be able to have a safe place to get their questions answered, to make their transaction to whatever, and that they know that the person who wrote the copy, the company, they know them, they see them, they understand those pain points. And as, as things get bigger and bigger, as technology grows, as we get spread more apart as humans, especially during the pandemic, where it felt like we didn't have any connection, that urge, that need to be seen and understood, even if it's by a blog that you're reading content that clicks with you and makes you feel like, yes, fuck yes, this person gets me, that is what's needed more than ever. And those, that's a lesson that I learned back in the 90s and that I would continue hammering on today and, and make even more important. The technology is great. What it can do for it is it's awesome. Again, awesome. Uh, that, <laughs> it, that we can do so much with what we have. And today, what we can do is so much different and bigger and better than what we did back then. But at the end of the day, we're still connecting with people. We're still asking them, hey, could you want to come into my world and learn a little bit about me? And maybe maybe you want to work with me and buy from me. And the more we keep that person in mind and remember that they're a person too with hopes and needs and desires and that we can help them, um, then I think the more, the more our sites will be successful, the more that we will feel personally successful too. It goes back to how I love search. Yeah, I love the geeky part. I love the writing. I love training people. But at the end of the day, I love knowing that there have been people that had that light bulb moment, that what I've said has helped them see their work in a different way or improve their websites or connect with their readers. And so that connection for me is the most important thing of everything that I'm doing and everything that I've always done. So that's probably why it's not like a geeky tip. It's more like, hey, remember people are people wherever they are. And the more you can connect with them, maybe the happier you'll be, <laughs> the happier they might be. And that's okay too. That's really interesting actually, because um where everything's going at the moment, where there's a big drive with AI, it almost feels like we are trying to move away from humans and towards machines. Whereas actually, fundamentally, it's connection. Like you say, it's human beings connecting, which is a, the foundation is underneath everything. And keeping that in mind is really important while we're all getting lost in, in this uh, evolution of how machines are developing. So yeah, it's gonna be fascinating actually to see where things go in the next few years. Maybe it might full yes. circle right back to all about humans connecting again. 
I would like to see that mm. uh, because in the, the other part of my business where I do coaching primarily to women who are 50 and above, um, one of the biggest things that they say is they don't feel seen. And we hear about that from women or from, from people that are of a certain age. But I feel that that's not just happening with people that are of that age, that it's younger people too, that they are they don't feel as seen or connected as they would like because we might have this, um, but it's not the same as, you know, in person or someone mm. who really feels like that you can, that is is feeling what you're feeling. Mm. So I wouldn't be surprised if throughout all of this, then we see another push towards how to build community, how to, you know, and different ways than just on Slack channels, right? Mm. <laughs> or having a blog, <laughs> ways that we have a hybrid of building out community. And maybe those are the businesses that will survive and thrive through all of this is that they've got that community aspect as well as they pro sell a product or a service. Yeah, interesting. I mean, it's circling right back again to the very beginning of the industry. And I know a lot of people say this, a lot of people I've spoken to have said, that one of the things they miss the most is the community. So, you know, um, Heather, what is it? What do you miss the most about the early days? The community, the community for sure, yeah. because it, especially back when nobody really understood what we were doing, mm -hmm. we were guaranteed that we could fly to a conference, be around our people and everyone got it. And not only did they get it, but they were excited to learn what you knew. And everyone was able to talk about that and to share those stories and to trade information back and forth in a way that felt felt cooperative and not competitive. So that that early community of flying in, doing our thing, talking to people offline and and building that out, that was such a gift. Again, and I again, I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to replicate that in my life, but I am so grateful that I had that because those core folks, the people that you're interviewing, uh, people that you will interview, um, those are the people that will always, even if I don't see them for 20 years, I will still continue consider them family. I would still get on a plane and fly to them if they needed me. And how much can people say that about folks that you met 25 years ago? You know, <laughs> that's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, it's uh, that word you use, cooperation. Um, yeah. For me, <clears throat> you know, doing a lot of the research, talking to everybody that I've been talking to, you know, that's something that comes up. And I do feel that would the SEO industry have evolved as it did if we hadn't had that cooperation and also the sort of the forums where everybody was helping each other. It was such a, a, an integral, important part of the early days. And that's really, I feel, what has formed the industry and help the industry. I feel like we're losing that a little bit now. It's changed so much, um, but yeah. It It is true that I feel like we've lost that as well. And part of that is just new players. Of course, they don't yeah. have the history because why would they? Um, and also because there's so many more opportunities. It's not like search engine strategies is the only place that people can go to learn about this anymore. Or ad tech, you know, there were very few conferences back in the day. Now there are a myriad of ways that people can learn about this and people might have their their guru, their expert that they might follow and they do everything that that person says to do or goes to the things they recommend, but it's not the same as being immersed with the same people all the time and learning about them on a personal and professional basis and having that kind of cooperation. Mm -hmm. So it's still kind of there with some people, you know, but with that sense of community, but it's not, it's not the same. <laughs> And I miss that a lot. Yeah, I, I think because it was so new as well, with yes. it being such a small and a really new industry, you were having to learn together. Whereas now, obviously, it's you know it's a mature, slightly maturing industry, twenty five years on. So you know we're facing uh, different issues and um, you know different approaches. Whereas back then it really was, oh my god, we've all got to learn together. We all need each other. Um, and we were fighting for for brand space back then yeah. too. It's like now people think SEO, like oh, of course you need that as part of your mm -hmm. marketing 
platform. Back then, we were trying to tell large companies, you need this. You need this now. If you don't do this now, you're going to fall behind. And that that intensity isn't quite the same anymore. But back then, trying mm. to get people to come along, come on, let me help you. Come on, this will be fun. Um, <laughs> that, that was a pretty cool thing, too. <laughs> Well, yeah, uh, I mean, we've been talking a while now, Heather. I think um, we'll start to wrap up. It's, um, it's been really interesting uh, hearing your stories. And um, it's just, yeah, it's so good to re reminisce and uh, look back to the early days. Is there anything else as we, before we wrap up? Anything else that you perhaps wanted to say? Oh, geez, we've covered so much. Um... I think the, the biggest thing that, that I have coming out of this is just a sense of gratitude. And that's why I was so excited to be on this podcast. I'm so excited to see that you're interviewing other people because I feel like the history of SEO got lost. And there's a lot of people who believe that SEO started around, I don't know, what, 2010, 2007 mm, yeah, or so yeah. after the recession. And they don't realize that there was all these people that were trying, they were doing so much back in the day, trying to bring yeah. search into the mainstream. Yeah. And so to be able to honor the people that have done what they've done, Kim, the Sherry's, the Greg's, the Jill's, all of those folks is such a wonderful gift. And thank you for that. Because for the, for those those people that are thinking about, should I do this? Should I get in this career? Should, do I want this? What is this going to be like? To be able to see those those stories or re watch them from back in the day of, of people reminiscing. I, for me, to, to know that history for any industry or anything is such an incredible gift. And I hope that it's the same gift for other people as well. And if nothing else, for us old timer geeks, it's fun <laughs> to watch the videos and be like, oh yeah, so you're telling that part of the story, but we all know what really happened then. <laughs> Which is going to be like your interview, the after dark of edition, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Oh, I like that. Maybe I do the after, yeah. yeah. You say you come to an event, you get us all drunk, yeah. and then you start to get us talking. And then it's like, oh, yeah, it's like back at the old pub cons where people were on stage drinking. <laughs> yeah yeah i like that idea yeah i think i'm gonna start inviting people into a room with a lot of booze and i'll be with my video camera a bit there like matt go. cuts with his notebook back in the day it'll, it'll be shelly walsh with the video camera in the background flying people hey there. With it would probably work you know because <laughs> actually for the record i don't drink um a bit like obviously Matt didn't so yeah I'm always the sober one in the room who remembers everything I, should, I probably, <laughs> probably shouldn't say that should I yeah I don't remember anything or or that that's a great way for you to make black mo male money to, to later on and like hey remember that one story <laughs> oh no the one thing that people who know me know about me is I never ever repeat anything I'm very true uh, yeah tr I what what I hear, oh my God, I know some so many interesting, so many stories, but no, they stay with me. I never share publicly. Um, very, I, I very think honorable. that's going to be interesting on the people that you interview because I have a feeling that you'll you'll have the same kind of reticence of like, I would really love to share the story with you, but you know I can't because of all the stuff it involves. Because even I'm thinking, oh yeah, there was that one party and there was that one time and there was that, but... <laughs> I don't want to get the text later of like, Heather, why? Why did you share that one? <laughs> yeah, well, I've got a few of those on film, which people have been, if they're willing to share, then obviously I'm willing to broadcast. But yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Heather, it's been fantastic talking to you. I've absolutely loved it. You've got a great energy. It's been brilliant. So um, I shall obviously wrap up at this point and say thank you very much, Heather, for being a pioneer and being on the show oh awesome thank you so much this has been such a remarkably fun interview and i appreciate you so much so thank you thanks heather bye okay, thank you bye